Michael, it's a great pleasure to speak to you this morning about storytelling. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. So how did this all start for you before we, we get into the detail of it? Where did, where did the storytelling bug bite you? Look, it wasn't initially storytelling as such. I was at uh, university studying accounting. And, oh um, boy, talk about the, that's the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Absolutely. So I was, <laughs> um, I guess, you know, like a lot of 20 year olds, my brain was starting to uh, think about things, um, the real world for the first time. And it was around about that time when I realized South Africa was a unique place and I didn't really understand it, even though I'd studied history, say from a trick. Um, and so it really came out of the origins of my own storytelling effectively came out of my curiosity to try and understand this place better uh, and the battles that I went through to try and get there. So why was it a battle? Um, that's curious to me. I mean, I'm also a student of history. I love reading about history. A lot of it is removed from us by generations, but you say it was a yeah, battle. Was it a language battle? Was it a difficult thing culturally to wrap your head around? How did you, how did you break through that? Well, I think for me, one of the challenges about studying South African history, certainly how most people study it in South Africa, say for, again, say from a trick, is mm -hmm. that somehow our system has found a way to extract all the emotion out of it and to convert it somehow into a series of bullet points um, and facts, which uh, we are required to then regurgitate um, at the age of 18 as fast as we can into three hours or whatever it might be. And we don't really get given much time. Obviously, some teachers are better than others, but we don't generally get given a whole heap of time to lean back and for the teacher to say, well, what does that make you feel? And how does that, can you imagine that was your mother or your father or your brother in that situation? And how, how would it feel to be on the ground? And so as I sort of aged and I guess got more nostalgic, I, I came to realize that I needed to really understand the South African story. I needed to, my, to try my best to really consider what it must have been like to be in the shoes of others. You can never do it entirely, but what you can try and do is explore the characters on all these various sides of the story. And through that, to try and understand why they were making decisions, which in today's terms, they feel totally illogical, irrational. And yeah. yet they were made with great confidence back in their own time. So Michael, as obviously students and fans of history, both of us will have been drawn to some people more than others. Who are the characters in South African history that that consumed you maybe as a child or into your early adulthood? No, I mean, I think, again, and this is not, these are not necessarily, I mean, the way you frame the question, I, I, as I look at them, I, I wouldn't describe the people I'll mention now as being great, but they were- Sure, they, they might be they horrible were, people, but, but great <laughs> stories. <laughs> in fact, you know, when you talk about South African history, well, it's always double-edged, you know, and all these, all these people have many sides to them, but the names that were really big when I was, was growing up were, um, you know, the likes of Jan Smuts. Um, you know, I remember, always remember Biko, my grandmother giving me a book about Biko growing up. Um, you know, to be honest, in my early years, it was less about the struggle. It seemed more like, again, like many certainly white South Africans, um, it seemed oh. to be more about the era leading up to 48, 1948 than, than, than subsequent to it. Um, but you know, even you know, Rhodes was a name which came up a lot. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I guess studying these people, in a, in, a, in a story manner, in other words, really concentrating on their, on their personalities, how they came to be, um, how they came to form their own opinions on, on South Africa and how it should be, be run. I find that element of it fascinating. You know, for example, Rhodes, for example, being, you know, why did he believe that the British Empire was the greatest thing and needed, and needed to be applied to South Africa? You know, understanding that stuff I found fascinating and only something I really got into much later in my, in my studies of history. But it's funny how now there's so much of history that's politicized that we've forgotten the, the characters and the, the nature of the obstacles those people in those days had to face. Um, and judging them by today's standards is obviously not only disingenuous because we're, we're not being fair to them with the lens of hindsight, but also it doesn't necessarily give the, the due credit to people whose lives were so different to ours and whose lives are much shorter and much more violent and much more turbulent and far more risky than ours. Now, when you tell these stories, I'm, I'm sure you're also moved by the fact that deep inside each of these very intricately woven tapestries that all of our lives eventually end up being, there's a character, there's a person, there's a, a human being with feelings, with ideas, with morals, with uh, their own sense of principles. And sometimes, it takes an enormous amount of imagination 
to put yourself in their own shoes. That's, that's something that only the great historians really can do. And more than great historians, the great storytellers. Yeah, so I, I think that is a huge part of, trying to do, of what I'm trying to do. So ultimately, if I, if I put it back a step, mm-hmm. I, I'm trying to make my little business inherit South Africa. The purpose of it is to try and make history more accessible to people. And I've found through my own experience, history books were not, but characters to your point are. And yeah. if you are prepared to go in with an open mind, and like I was, I grew up obviously looking at South Africa through the eyes of my own tribe, as a really English-speaking tribe. Sure. And so I came with huge biases, of course. I mean, Rhodes wasn't a name which growing up around the table was, well, he wasn't hated. You know, and probably my grandparents probably revered him. I didn't revere him, but I didn't hate him. And yeah. um, yet, as I, I need to get to a point where you understand it from all sides. And that was, that is, that was the investment for me, the, the time taken to get into the shoes of those people who would ordinarily have been on the other side and to understand the human side. And when you do that, when you're prepared to do that, you know, one discovers, I, certainly I have discovered moments of extraordinary inspiration, that, that, that human beings are, incred- are capable of, you know, all sorts of things, good and bad, but there are so many amazing things that South Africans have done, uh, which, have, which, have been, which I've come to find inspirational, which I just, you know, ordinarily would have been left outside off stump. So, so tell me about the business. Um, how does it work? How, how, do you, how do you get these stories to people and, and inspire them? I'm, I'm such a fan of what you're doing, by the way, just because I think history is the, it's the most important subject anyone can study at school, and not necessarily in an academic sense, but because it gives you an idea of the story of humanity. And if you, if you feel that you are attached to some part of that history, it, it gives you a, an idea of your place in, in the, the, the big story and, and the context of, of human you know, tragedy and comedy and emotion. But how do you deliver that effectively to people so that it doesn't become like the, the, the ugly, boring lectures, the squalid lectures that we were given at school by teachers who didn't necessarily have a passion for it? Yeah, I think, I think the easiest way to, to answer that question relatively quickly would be to say that um, I realized that South Africans we're struggling to get around the, get around the, the heads around the South African story, as had I, my own battles that I referred to. So I thought hard about how it might work. I, I had my own financial career, which I only, you know, this is all relatively new to me. I, I resigned in, on June the 30th, 2015. Um, all right. <laughs> and I began to write a story called My Father's Coat, which I had a very good feel for how I wanted to structure it. And that, that had been influenced by many parts of the thing, but of my life, but you know, a key moment w- was a visit to um, Isan Luana and Fugitive's Drift, the stories of um, uh, Rourke's, Rourke's Drift and, Isan, and the Battle of Isan Luana. And I heard Rattray speak, and uh, that trip was, was influential in that I suddenly realized, you know, I walked, in the, I walked into Zululand um, expecting, to your point, something of a history lecture, and I was moved, and I walked out of Zululand two, two days later believing the Zulu people were the most fascinating people. I was inspired to go and read more about them. But with that came the idea that Firstly, storytelling had a power. And secondly, that you know, if we can find ways of telling the stories of human beings, uh, you can find inspiration and attachment to all sorts of peoples. And I thought, well, is there a way to take that, that, that battlefields model and to try and apply it on a slightly broader manner? And, and this was the broad idea from what, what became my father's coach, where I, again, wanted to use a, a limited number of characters, which gives me enough time to describe the wrinkles under their eye. Yet at the same time, I can in the background describe the broad brushstrokes of, of South African history. And this was the idea. So I chose these five characters from very different sides of the story. And mm-hmm. again, in that sense, to try and keep it entertaining on the one side, obviously it is nonfiction, but it's, these people have great characters through which to tell stories about. And in the background, you slowly see the South African story being woven together. And for many people, I guess the feedback is for the first time, really, all these various dynamics that, that have affected us uh, you know, in a single sitting, seeing them come together. So that was the basis for it. And, and, and I guess that was, it was really instinct that I, I, that I would choose to tell them through people. Um, you know, the storytelling that we learn around the fire with our families and friends. And you know, no, no real science behind it, but for the fact that what I knew was entertaining from when other people told me stories. Um, so that was the basis for it. And I, so I wrote my father's coach uh, and that was, well, I thought it was gonna take about three or four months. I thought I'd be mm-hmm. finished by the end of 2015, ready to tell it. 
but two years later, I was uh, just about putting the, the, last, uh, the last bits together. So it took a lot longer than I thought. It was a bit stressful. Um, and then I got to the point where I had written the story. It was ready for the market. But of course, I had no market. I have no brand. I have no name. And uh, so I had about two months where it was relatively quiet, although people were starting to take some interest. And it was those two months that, that I wrote the first series of what became what has become the Friday story. And really, because I had a bit of time on my hands and I'd come across quite a few interesting little snippets, which I thought I could turn into nuggets. And I really enjoyed putting those together. And I wished, well, I intended at that time to carry on. But at that point, my speaking did pick up. And, um, you know, people took to my father's coach a level, which I couldn't really have, have anticipated or dreamed of. And, um, and so the next real time I've had an opportunity like that has been COVID-19. And so now we're seeing series three come through. Well, that's terrific. I'm glad that it's given you a, a gap where you could write and a, where you could get back to work in terms of telling these stories. You know, we had a guy called um, Butso Koza on not so long ago who tells these stories in song. And oh. uh, he's put together a musical about the Battle of Isantrana, which is just unbelievable. Oh, and I wow. suppose... I suppose there are there are so many reserves in this country of of great tales to tell and of of means of telling them whether it's through the written word the spoken word singing dancing um, you know the various expressions of culture and art and I'm sure that you have found no lack of source material when it's you know become necessary for you to go out there and do the research or to or to speak to people who who might have had an appreciation for the other side of a story. Am I right? South Africa is just full of that, that stuff. You just have to yeah, know so, so I, I am of the opinion that the Friday story could carry on indefinitely. Um, they are, <laughs> I've got an Excel spreadsheet, which grows um, a lot quicker than I can write of right. stories, which I'd love to tell. And I will, you know, I hope to get there. And look, I, I've actually really enjoyed the second series. I've, I've written five of the, I've sent two into the, into the, um, onto the internet. Three, the next three Fridays will be the next three. I've loved putting them together and I've got Excel spreadsheets. And interestingly, the, the, every time I send one out, I get to emails back saying, do you know about this chap? And do you know about this story? And so, you know, I, I, there's no shortage of stories. I mean, the other thing, for slight, you know, on a slightly more philosophical level, you know, what happens, I mean, 1994 kind of, there was a line in the ground in South Africa. And, yeah. you know, speaking about anything before that, it's, it's slightly taboo. It's just, you know, our, our past is... You know, it was a deeply painful thing for, for many people. And yeah, I think most people know. become people become so apologetic and hand wringing. And, you know, it is what it is. Um, and history doesn't really care whether you like it or not. It is the story of where we come from. And there were victors and there were oppressors and there were there were people who were oppressed and there were losers. And unfortunately, as cold and callous as that is, it has made us the people that we are today. If we don't accept our history, we're going to be doomed to repeat it. Don't you think? Well, my, my, my take was that, you know, when we got to 94, with, with every good intention, we, we, we as a nation took a covenant that we would look forward. This was the, sort of the birth mm -hmm. of the rainbow nation concept where right. we would say, yeah, we acknowledge our past is evil uh, and was disastrous and were deeply painful and damaging to so many people. And we were going to look forward and, and we were going to forget about the past. And instead we were going to embrace, and this was the rainbow nation. And I think it's catching up to us uh, to a certain extent and that we haven't, we sort of outsourced acknowledging what actually happened to the truth and reconciliation <laughs> or someone else. You know, we, look, we were, I mean, I was yeah. relatively, you know, a similar, probably a similar vintage. And we, we outsourced that, that, that job of taking the, the emotion in and really accepting, you know, how exactly what did happen. And, and I think it's, to my, I think it's caught up with us. And I, I think it's now a good time to, you know, 20 years down, 25 years down the line to, take a good look at it and to think about what happened, you know, what, you know, you might be able to learn certain things, but beyond that, just, just to understand it so that you can, you know, well, if you want to feel apologetic, well, then you know what you're apologizing about. If you want to forgive, you can understand what you're forgiving for. It's not just some blanket thing, which we acknowledge was evil. We, there's, I think there's real power. There's, it, it builds one's meaning. If, if you're going to live in South Africa and you're not going to hop on a plane, well, this, let's live, you know, let's live a meaningful existence. And I think that's why our past don't, is such don't a you, don't you find, Michael, it's also, and this is a sad reality, is there are so many people who've been put off of history, either because they were taught it badly at school, or because they think it has nothing to do with them, and it is looking backwards rather than teaching you something about yourself. 
There are many people who just have not had that bug bite and don't care for history at all. I often find that they're the same kind of people who don't care about a lot of things, but that's my opinion. Yeah, and, and I guess that's you know, hence my, my, my comment earlier to say I'm trying to make it more accessible because if we mm -hmm. do, we can't, I mean, you know, any number of, you stand around the, around the dinner or sit around the dinner table, you know, mm. two out of eight will put their hand up and say, no, I hate history. I mean, I, I, I did it at school. It's, it's the worst thing I've ever done. But of course, you know, they, they come, they're still in that world of bullet points and regurgitating facts, which is, <laughs> I'd hesitate to call that history. It's just fact, it's just a sort of, it's like an IQ test. You know, history is about really understanding, it's really a summary of all the other subjects. It's, it's try, you know, you can't, history can't stand alone as a subject of bullet points. So the, the, the Zulu nation are a, a source of great inspiration and, and uh, curiosity in me. I remember I grew up in, I, did, I went to primary school in KwaZulu-Natal and we learned a bit of Zulu and we learned very basically. And again, you know, they didn't spend too much time on black history at school because I was in a then white school. But I remember learning about Shaka Zulu and Dingan and Sezanga Kona and, and Mpande and then later on the Chwayo. And it to me was a, a beautiful story that I compared in my brain to what I knew about English history. But there were lots of other people who learned that history with me who would, despite the fact that the teachers were quite good, not as interested. What part of Zulu history is, is the most interesting to you? Is it those battles? Is it the... the I actually, I mean, I, I put it, one of my little Friday stories is, is, is on the origin of the, of the Zulu people. And, I, and yeah. I think that's a little under, it's a sort of underrepresented part of their story. I, I mean, as an independent empire or nation, whatever you might want to, you know, they were only, it was only a two couple generations, 63 years, mm. I think it was. And, um, but those early years, you know, when Shaka um, left the Zulu people, his mother and headed off to the El Gheni, and then slowly made his way back uh, through Dingaswayo. And, and you know, reassume control over the Zulu people, uh, installing the sense of pride, the military power. Um, you know, it's a part of the story which probably doesn't get nearly as air, much airtime as the end of the sort of independent Zulu Empire, the, the battles right. of Asante Luana and Norks Drift. But I, lo I love that sort of you know, imagining this young child growing up with so much pain and finding a way to focus his energy through the military. I, it's, it's a wonderful part of the story, which is probably not told, in my opinion, enough. And obviously, some of those those tribal. Um, rifts, some of those divisions still carry through today. You know, you've got members of the Mtetwa family who are, they consider themselves like better than the Zulu and, and they consider their history more illustrious and more ancient than the Zulu nation. And they, they probably think that they're the heirs to that nation in any, in any respect. But it is interesting that these stories also have international acclaim. They're not just the stories for South Africans. There are people all over the world who want to know about the history of the Zulu, about Cecil John Rhodes, about Jan Smuts, right? Yeah, so I mean, to that point, I think, you know, I've got a story coming up in a couple of weeks. In, in London's Parliament Square, there are 12 statues. Um, right. There were recently 11. They added a 12, which was the first, the first woman. And that's a story on its own, I guess. But the first 11 were all men. Uh, of those 12, uh, eight of them were born in the British Isles. Four of them were, are international. Uh, three of those and four... Three of, three of them spent an enormous amount of time or worse South African. Right. So you can just... I mean, I, and I guess it is because our stories carry the fire which hardens the stick. That, that be, Because of those the tensions that evolved in the colonies... Um, it, it created I, I hate to be a stickler. I hate to be a stickler, but anyone listening to this now is going to go and look them up. So you may as well tell us who they are: the Mandela and and yeah, Smuts Mandela, and Smuts, then Gandhi, Gandhi and Lincoln. Abraham. And and so Lincoln. Lincoln, it's good, good company. Yeah. Right. Okay. The only one they're not South African or no South African connection is Lincoln. It's amazing. Yes. Uh, although our stories, um, our stories interact to, to a certain extent. Cotton and gold had a very similar. Uh, impact on, on, on how labor was treated and the social impacts of those. And Gandhi ties it together quite nicely with his, um, his boycotts of cotton, albeit long after Lincoln's right. time. So, Michael, um, where do we take this? And is there a way for you to, to make this your full-time occupation? Is there a way for you to make this uh, a money earner? Is there something that you've thought about long-term that, that makes it a possibility for consuming up all of your attention and time, wouldn't that be nice? So, 
Look, I mean, that's all, all I have been doing for the last five years. I don't have a co corporate career anymore. Only, uh, this you got nothing else. You got nothing else going on. This is your whole job. <laughs> so my my um, yeah, my revenue dropped to a very easy round number uh, as soon as COVID started. <laughs> Speaking of events, was my was my only source of revenue. Um, right. But um, yeah, I, I, I funny enough, I'm feeling quite excited about these Friday stories, and okay. I so once I'm finished series two, I'm going to look at I'm going to spend a couple of weeks writing series, starting to write series three. And then for series three, what I'm looking to do is to have a live version where I spend a few extra minutes up front explaining why I, I thought the story was interesting, where I came across it, then to deliver it live. And obviously this would be the first time the world would be seeing that particular story. And then to spend 10 or 15 minutes at the end engaging um, as best one can in a webinar environment, just answering questions. Um, so I'm gonna try, I'm gonna, I'm gonna experiment with that. Um, uh, and to see if there's sufficient value to to get people in to to want to see the story delivered live, um, and otherwise, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a speaking the speaking career will pick up again in in due course. It may be longer than I initially anticipated, but um, yeah, otherwise it's just in like anyone else. I mean, I, it's just a reinvention process that I'm going through, which I'm still I'm reasonably excited about, although. Yeah, you know, again, like all of us, a bit stressed in terms of where, you know, how, how it's going to pan out from a uh, you know, revenue perspective. Well, I think it's extremely brave, but also the contribution you're making is much more valuable in some ways than just being another number cruncher. I mean, don't, no disrespect to all the other accountants by any means, but it's great that you found your passion. And I'm so pleased that you're able to share these stories with so many of us. So congratulations. And I hope we hear more from you. Great. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Michael Chotten, everybody.